honor you uh, for being here. Just a wonderful day to lift up our hearts to Jesus this brisk morning. Glad to see you here. Even though it's a little cool outside, uh, good to see you in the Lord's house to lift up your heart and worship him today. Amen. Amen. This morning we're going to open with a word of prayer, and uh, then we're going to have an opportunity today to honor uh, one of our ministry families in the church, as you seen advertised that we're going to do today we'll uh, we'll begin our service with that and then we'll press into the lord's presence and worship hear his word and uh, enjoy a moment together this morning would you bow your hearts with me as we pray lord we honor you and right at the beginning of the day we want to say thank you for all the blessings of life and strength thank you for all the trials that you've carried us through this week Thank you for every mercy that you've shown to us and the families gathered here today. Thank you, Lord, for every benefit of your kindness. Thank you for every grace you've extended our way. Lord, you have been so good to us. You have been so faithful to us. Your love has been so steadfast and dependable, Lord. So we begin the day by honoring you in your house and saying thank you. Thank you for every kindness that you've extended. Lord, we don't deserve how good you've been to us, but we are so grateful for the love you've shown us this week. Father, we honor you and we bless you in your house. We ask you, Lord, that all that we do today would be honoring and pleasing to your name. We pray today, God, that you would get great glory out of the service. And Lord, bless all of our efforts to praise you as you so deserve to be worshiped. In Jesus' name and for his sake, and all God's people said, would you give the Lord a great hand of praise at the beginning of the day, amen? We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen. Today, I want to invite the Price family to come and join me on stage this morning. And we're going to do this right at the beginning of the service, and then we'll press into worship today. Amen. We have designated today as an opportunity to celebrate and honor this great ministry family in our church. Chad and Gina have served for seven years here at the Hill, and Ari and Noah arrived as soon as they could after that. Amen. Every week, uh, Chad prepares our choir, our praise team, our orchestra, and our rhythm section to lead us in worship and music. He serves on the state music committee where he helps plan prayer conference and state camp meeting every year. He works behind the scenes here at the Hill with hospital visits, pastoral care to homebound members and shut-ins and those in nursing homes and facilities. He helps plan and decorate for major events and holiday celebrations. In fact, I doubt there's been a single event that his hand has not touched in some creative way over the last seven years. He and Gina also lead a growth group in their homes on Sunday nights here at the Hill. Gina serves, as a in, serves in our community as a nurse at the Southern Cancer Center, and each week she helps lead a Sunday morning life group here called the Hill Young Adults. Recently, Pastor Chad took and passed his final minister's exam for the third rank of ministry in the Church of God, and at an upcoming state meeting, he will, be re he will receive his ordained bishop credential, which is the highest rank of ministry in our denomination. That's a high honor. I'm thankful today for their presence among us as friend, as a worship leader, as a fellow minister of the gospel of Jesus. In a few moments, you'll have an opportunity to bless them during our offering time today and let them know that you love them and that you appreciate their ministry here. But right now, I've invited some friends to come to help me honor this great family today. Amen. And so I want to invite, uh, let's see, Craig and Katie. Someone's coming from the choir. Katie, Craig, y'all come on from the choir this morning. And while they're coming, I'll give Shay an opportunity to present on behalf of the Women's Ministries Department. We have a treat for Miss Gina today. Um, I'm going to say a couple of things. Uh, my kids were, one of my children was sick this week, and I looked outside, and there's a box of Krispy Kreme donuts sitting outside where Gina has bought and snuck up the yard and laid them there for us. And I say that because I know she doesn't just do those things for me. She does those for people here in little ways that she loves in, on y'all. One of the things that I'm most thankful for is I think when you go out in our community, um, your reflection, a good reflection of Jesus first and Forest Hill. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful for you the way you love. Love our people and the way you love Mobile. Would y'all give Gina a special hand? Okay. I'm going to show one because everybody will want to see. First of all, I have it upside down, which is normal, but we will flip it over. Um, we have a picture of your family because I know one of the things that means the most to you is your family and a couple of treats in a bag. We love you, dear. Vanna? Yeah. Thank you. Love you all. Yeah. Appreciate you, sir. Amen. Amen. 
Ken, Craig and Katie. You can go first. All right. Okay. So seven years, man, it's been like super fast. It's gone by so fast serving with you guys and worshiping with you guys. And you mean this, the world to me. When I was thinking about from 1030 to 1115, knowing every Sunday that I can be part of a worship team and get to sing in the choir for those 45 minutes every Sunday, I look forward to it so much. Just coming in, worshiping the Lord, worshiping behind you and singing songs to lift up the name of the Father. If everything, he does a great job bringing us into the presence of the Lord every week. And we are so honored, we're so grateful and thankful to have you guys as our, as our worship pastors and our worship team. We're so thankful for that. Um, we've collected, Katie, for the last uh, three or four weeks has been collecting, but she has uh, done an amazing job. Choir. On behalf of the choir and our choir, we just want to give you a card, and inside the card is a bunch of that green stuff. So we're so thankful. Chadwick, <laughs> on behalf of the musicians as well as the choir, you and Gina, and the little ones are the best. So this morning, um, before I present to the kids on behalf of the kids department, uh, I just I felt like for all of you guys, I know I haven't, I haven't been here too long, going on a year almost, but um, can honestly say that you guys have, have quickly become some of my best friends. And uh, you take care of me like, like, like I'm family. And uh, I, know, I know my parents are happy for that because uh, they're always looking for somebody to take care of me. So, um, and I can promise you I need it because I would probably starve if, they, if these guys weren't here. So they do take great care of me. And um, so, but I am here on behalf of the kids department because I think Ari and Noah from the moment I got here, uh, we kind of bonded, we're, we're pretty tight. And whether that's here at church, we're all hanging out or Noah's in the office with me watching whatever Minecraft videos he wants to watch like last week. That's, that's what we did one office day um, when they were out of school um, or whatever. But um, we've just kind of bonded. And I think some of that comes from me being the the preacher's kid, I, I know what it's like for you guys. You guys go everywhere with mom and dad, and you spend a lot of time here, and you're like, yes, we do. But I promise it's all worth it, and preacher's kids got, got to stick together, right? That's right. So this is a gift on behalf of the kids all from, from, from us and how much we love you. We love you so very much. I don't think it will be hard to tell whose gift is what, okay? So when we get to the kids hall, I'll let you dig into it, okay? I love you guys. Chad, uh, like Pastor said, uh, they talked about just being in the community. We actually ran into someone recently in the community, and um, Heather and I were out, and um, we told them where we went to church, and uh, they said, do you, do you know Chad Price? I said, oh, yes, yes. And, and I was like, he's a great guy. And they're like, yes, he is. So Chad and, and Gina, they are, they're a wonderful family. They're in the community. They're, they're loving on people. And we're so thankful for them. This is just a small appreciation from the media department because you guys are, you know, we work so well together and just getting the music together and the planning center. And, you know, we couldn't, we could, we just enjoy working with you guys. And we're so thankful for you guys. I, I honestly, personally have never seen you guys not smiling. You're always just, you're just always just a bright sunshine. And I want to thank you guys for that. We love you. Gina goes, I'm telling you, she goes above and beyond for our group. I mean, even the minute, minute details, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. She does a great job, and she loves, she genuinely cares and loves um, for each of us in our class, and we are thankful for your family, and I am thankful for your friendship. I, truly, I am. And um, just a little something for you, because we love you.
two years ago when we started growth groups here at the Hill, uh, we kind of had an overflow uh, and uh, Chad and Gina opened up their home uh, for us overflow people. Uh, and uh, we appreciate them so much, the hospitality that they show us. Uh, uh, they're good cooks. Uh, and uh, just the friendship and getting to know them more intimately, they serve as a team. Uh, they both present the lessons together, and it's good to know their hearts, and their hearts are ones of service. Uh, they are here for whatever God wants them to do, and we love them and appreciate them, and uh, we just have a little something for you. Um, Amen. Well, thank you, guys. Chad, Gina, you want to greet our folks tonight? <laughs> um, wow, thank y'all. Everyone, every one of these groups means so much to us, and we love each and every one of you very, very much. And it is hard to believe that it's been almost seven years since we've been here, but we are so thankful. And it has gone by quickly, Craig. It really has. And um, it's been a labor of love every step of the way. And we felt supported and family. I'll never forget Larry Bean and Gina Bean told us about a year after we'd been here that, that no matter where you'd go in life or whatever, that you would never find a church that would love you and include you as family like Forest Hill does. Amen. And that has been the absolute truth. Um, we are so thankful that we serve here. We, we are here, we, we, we love being here, and, um, and there's nowhere else we would rather be than right here. And we believe that the best is yet to come, and God is doing marvelous things, things we've prayed for, things we've asked him for, and, and he's doing it right in front of our very eyes. And it's such a wonderful blessing to be a part of your journey, each and every one here, as well as you going alongside of us in our journey. And so we're thankful, we're thankful for our staff, we're thankful for our pastor, Daniel and Shea Blaylock. We, I tell people all the time, I tell people all the time, I swear this, that you will never find another pastor easier to work for. He's not a boss. He is just, just a wonderful friend, and I respect him, and he's easy to respect, and his family is precious to us. And, uh, and our, our, our staff, John and, and Austin and Tristan and Tara now, and just everyone, everyone on staff, it's just incredible. Our office staff, I'll, if I name names, it just I would forget someone, but we serve with just the most amazing people, and you are blessed for us still to, not for, for, with us, but with everyone else, you are blessed to have some of the finest people to lead you, and we are so thankful. We love y'all. Okay, I have a story, but I will not take all morning, I promise. Um, it was about a year or two ago, Alan Reed was serving in the kids' hall, and he came up to me after church and said, are you guys planning on leaving? I said, no, why? He said, well, Ari went up for prayer, and she said, I just want to pray that we never leave Mobile, <laughs> and that we never leave <laughs> Forest Hill. Do you know what that means when your child is praying that you stay exactly where you are? And I am telling you, that made my heart so full, but also I feel like even over the last year or so, we have just grown to love even more of you guys. Definitely developed some close personal relationships um, with some of the older generation, some of the younger. And I am telling you, just like Chad said, you guys are our family. I never imagined us being so far south um, but I'm telling you, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. We love you guys, and we are completely humbled this morning by all of you. And um, we just, I just hope you know above anything that we pray for you and we love you. Amen. Amen. Standing. 
Amen. Go ahead and remain standing, if you will. You join me in a word of prayer as we just ask God's blessing on them and on our day. Lord, we love you. Again, we thank you today, Lord, for uh, great staff and leadership in our church. We thank you for Chad and Gina, for Ari and Noah. Thank you for this great family and all that they mean for us. Lord, we thank you for all the grace that you've shown us as the body of Christ. We thank you for the blessing of our church. Thank you that we get to be part of such a great church that has a great history and legacy of ministry. But Lord, we're excited that has a great future and a great destiny ahead. And we thank you, Lord, that you are using us and blessing us today. Lord, we lift our hearts up to you and ask for your strength and help in every way. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. remain standing as we sing to the Lord today. Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. One more time, give God a great hand of praise. This is worth it.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, come on and lift your hands, all you people in this room, and give him glory. Because he's worthy to be praised. There is none like him. Father, we know that we serve a faithful and able God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. He's a miracle-working God. And he's not about to stop now. Come on, let's sing this together. I give you glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to follow after you. Somebody say, and now I'm ready. And now I'm ready for whatever. Say your presence is an open door. Say we want you. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence, say your presence is an open door. So come. Somebody testify right now. Say in every season, in every season, His grace, His grace has been enough. Now by faith, I Father this morning and say, your presence is an open door. We want, we want you, Lord, never like ever before. Yeah, say, your presence is an open door. So
on and just ask him in your own way say Lord come hey. oh we look to you with expectation knowing that you're the author and the finisher of our faith through you all things are possible do you believe that this morning that you still serve an able faithful God a miracle working God come on then by faith lift this up say I know I know sink in your spirit this morning he's made you a promise and he won't stop he's not tired of you he's not through with you oh he made you a promise and he won't stop now y'all remember that children's song I am a promise I am a possibility you remember that I'd like to turn this around, this phrasing around a little bit. We've been singing, I've been singing it as if, you know, he made me a promise and he won't stop now. But let me just encourage somebody this morning who may be struggling in your faith. Maybe your purpose is and you think maybe God is striven with you for too long. That's a word, I don't know, striven. Um, strove. <laughs> but it, he's not through with you. He's not through with you. He's made you a promise. When you committed your life to him, he made you a promise. You are his promise. And he won't stop now. That's for somebody today. I really believe that. You are God's promise. He did everything he did. He went to the cross. He suffered. He died. He left us. He sent a comforter for you, each and every one of us in this room. We're your promises, Jesus. And we know that you'll never be through, never throw us away. Because you're faithful. Come on, tell them your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord. I never. Savior God to thee. 
Excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you've ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? For you made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all things that pass through the paths of the ocean. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. The Lord reigns. Lord reigns. Give him one more hand of praise this morning before you're seated. Amen. Amen. You can be seated today. Amen. Just a moment, our ushers are coming, and they're going to give us a chance to honor the Lord with our giving, His tithe, and our offering. And we're going to give you an opportunity this morning to bless the Price family so you can give an offering for them. Anything not designated otherwise will go for them. Or feel free to mark on your envelope, uh, Pastor Chad or the Price family, and we'll make sure that they know about your love gift. Amen. So please bl help bless them in that way today. We're so glad you came to worship with us today. We're thankful to have our waterfront friends with us. Third Sunday of the month. Welcome our friends. Amen. Always great to have you guys with us. Tonight is our last growth group of this semester. And so we're meeting tonight for our final one. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to jump in this time, you, they have been wonderful. And you will get another chance to sign up right after Christmas for the spring semester that will be beginning in, in January of growth groups. Wonderful opportunity. Don't forget about those tonight. Many of you are celebrating tonight with some kind of Thanksgiving feast. That's going to be wonderful. Amen. My group, my mama made dressing before she left. And it's going in the oven this afternoon. Tony, I can't wait till 6 o'clock tonight. I'm just saying. It's going to be glorious. I bet the Bible study will be good too, but it's going to be good. Amen. Amen. Senior Adult Thanksgiving Luncheon. Speaking of Thanksgiving, we're having our Senior Adult Monthly Fellowship this Wednesday at 1030 in the Fellowship Hall. We will provide the chicken and dressing, and we're asking our senior adults to provide the sides and the desserts, as you always do. Join us. Don't miss it. Wonderful time of fellowship together. Amen. Tickets are available for the Senior Adult Christmas Banquet, okay? That is also up and coming. Senior Adult Christmas Banquet. If you're a member of Forest Hill, $5 is your price. If you're not a member of Forest Hill, $18.50 is your price. I have a membership class next week. How's that for incentive? Amen. Amen. Membership has its privileges, right? Yes, it does. Amen. Amen. I know there is a, a, a wedding shower this afternoon in honor of Miss Katie Connors. It's in the fellowship hall. Uh, 3 o'clock, am I correct? Three o'clock. All right. Don't forget about that. Blanket making. Tomorrow night at 6 in the Fellowship Hall. Bring your scissors, ladies. Sign up to help us distribute them. Uh, but those are going to be going on uh, tomorrow night. We'll be making those, so don't forget about that. And come and help us. Bless our homebound and shut-in members in that way. Uh, lots of other things are going on at the Hill. We won't cover them all. They're in your bulletin, in your newsletter. We'd refer you there to find out more details. Amen. Amen. So let's bow our hearts for prayer one more time and ask God to bless our offering and our gifts today. Lord, you've been faithful and loyal to us, and we thank you. Bless these gifts of love today. We pray that you multiply them forward to the kingdom and back to those who give them, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so thankful for Chad and Gina and all their commitment for our worship ministries and for our life group. 
We came to Forest Hill about a year ago and it didn't take any time at all for them to start treating us like family and make us feel welcome. So thank you, we love you guys. It's hard putting into words how much I appreciate Chad and Gina, but I am so thankful for the amount of dedication that they put into the worship ministries and the amazing job they're doing at leading their growth group. The prices are so faithful to Forest Hill, and they don't think of their commitments to the church as something that is just unavoidable, but they do the things they do because they really want to and they genuinely care, and that is something that we should be so grateful for. I love the whole Price family so much, and I'm very, very thankful for them. some of the reasons that people stay at that church and come to that church because it's always good to see Regina's smiling face and hear Chad's laugh you can hear him a mile away you know, I remember the first time that Chad asked me to join the choir he pretty much begged me up there he's like Jason we gotta have your voice up there I've never heard a voice like yours ever and you know I did not realize to this day that you could get paid for singing in the choir of the church thank you Chad but in all seriousness I love you guys to death really do. I can talk to you about anything. I love seeing y'all every time I come to that church. Y'all are some of the greatest people that I know. I love you guys. in Jesus' name.
Amen. Aren't you thankful for the joy of the Lord today? Amen. You enjoyed this choir and worship team leading us in the presence of the Lord this morning. Thank you, guys. Amen. Amen. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our what? Our strength. Amen. Whatever you've been facing and whatever you will face, you'll need strength this week. Amen. And the way to walk in strength is to walk in joy. Amen. To walk in the joy of the Lord. If you have your Bible this morning, I'm going to read two passages, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. We'll be parking in the book of Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read Numbers 11 and then Philippians chapter 2. So if you're quick on your feet, you can look up both. If it takes you a minute, just go on to Philippians 2, and I'll be there about the time you get there. Amen? Amen. Amen. Great day to be in the Lord's house. Amen? Amen. Thankful for the joy of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Isn't it great to see Bonnie and Sonny Beasley in the Lord's house with us back there this morning? Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. Amen. Every November we talk a lot about giving thanks. And this month we're talking about going a step further and that is actually living thanks. Amen. Living out our gratitude to God. So we're talking about thanks living this season. Amen. We talked a couple of weeks ago about unwrapping the gift. The first thing you can do to say thank you when someone gives you a gift is open it and enjoy it. And so we unwrap the gift and we talked about God's gift of salvation and how that God wants us to open the gift of receiving Jesus, his forgiveness, his new life to be adopted into his family and born again by faith in the Son of God. Amen. We talked about that. Have you unwrapped the gift of salvation? Today we're going to talk about the next step in living a grateful life, and that's is focusing not on something we should do, but something we should stop doing. One of the ways that we show we're grateful is not only by what we do and say, but by what we choose not to say. Have any of you ever raised a child who just didn't know what not to say? Oh, pray for us. Amen. Amen. It's, it, that, that's a struggle, isn't it? It's a struggle. Uh, last year, whenever we had our Easter extravaganza, we had the train out here, the little kitty train. And I remember in that trip, Shay got on the train with one of our children who she shall remain nameless. Um, and sitting across from her on the train was this lady who was visiting us, and she was really into body art, tattoos. And if that's your thing, Lord bless you, that's cool. I don't think I could pull that off. I can barely get a flu shot, amen. I, I, it's just, I don't think I could do that. Um, uh, but here she was, and she had quite a few. She had multiple children, and she had the names of all her children uh, somewhere on her body, and that was her way of honoring them. And our child noticed this and really got carried away and just kept on commenting about that. And she said, you know, and, and a lot of green writing on her. And she made a remark, and she said, well, you know, at least you don't have to pick out anything special for St. Patrick's Day, right? My wife looked at her and said, didn't you say you have multiple children? And she said, yes. And she said, then I'm sure you are quite used to children saying things that they should not say. And she smiled and she said, oh, yes, yes, ma'am, I am. And she was very gracious to us. Amen. I'm very thankful for that. Parents get it, don't we? Can I tell you, sometimes God's children say things they ought not say too. Sometimes as God's children, we have a bad habit of griping and murmuring and complaining and lots of negative things like that coming out of our mouths instead of giving thanks and expressing gratitude to God for how as good he's been. And the Bible tells us about that in the book of Numbers. There's a whole book in the Bible about people who complain. In fact, when people read through their Bible, they often stop at the book of Numbers and they don't read it. They get bogged down in the genealogy and they just quit reading they say the book of numbers is not it's it's not for today it really doesn't have anything to say to me and I'm sitting there going a guy named Moses pastoring a bunch of people who just complain all the time what could that have to speak to the present moment right yeah I, I mean really it, it, it is actually very accurate for today amen God's people complaining about something. Nothing changed, right? The book of Numbers is all about that. In fact, in Numbers 11, verses 1 to 3, you get the first encounter with this group of people and their story in this way. Amen? 
And so we'll, we'll jump into that uh, together in just a moment. Numbers 11. The Bible urges us that we should stop complaining. In fact, he says that very plainly in Philippians 2. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Read that with me. Do all things without complaining and disputing. We need to stop complaining. Complaining has a long history in the Bible. In fact, the Bible tells us that the first complaint came from the first man. And all the women said, it's about right, isn't it, ladies? Yes. The first complaint in the Bible was from a man. He was complaining. And he was complaining about, guess who? His wife. That's right. That's the first complaint in the Bible. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12, the man said to the Lord, the woman you gave me, she gave me of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. So he's blaming her and throwing her under the bus. And it shouldn't surprise us that not only does the first complaint come from the first man, but the first complaint follows the first sin. Amen. We sin, and then we end up complaining about the fruit of our sin. According to the Bible, our complaining usually says more about our own spiritual state than about our circumstances. Don't say amen, say oh me. Yes, the Bible is very clear on that. Our complaining says a lot about our own spiritual state. In fact, I want to show you that in the Word today. We're, we are like the man whose grandchildren rubbed Limburger cheese under his nose while he was taking a nap. And he woke up and he took a breath and went, man, this room stinks. And he left the bedroom and walked into the living room and said, have mercy, the whole house stinks. And then he walked out and opened the front door and took a deep breath and said, oh, you've got to be kidding me, the whole world stinks. And the whole time the problem was right under his own nose. That's often how we are, isn't it? The problem is often right under our nose. Numbers 11, verses 1 to 3. Hear the word of the Lord from the Old Testament. Now the people, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Tabera, which means burning because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Amen. That's God's word from the Old Testament. Now the New Testament, Philippians 2 verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. If these passages make anything clear, it's this. Complaining is usually sinful and we are commanded to stop doing it. Amen? I want you to notice with me today. Paul mentions three people that will benefit if I will replace complaining with thanksgiving in my life. Three people that will benefit greatly. Are you ready? Let's talk about them. Number one, we should stop complaining. We should refrain from complaining for the sake of your own soul. Say that with me. We should do it for the sake of of our own souls. Paul ties the command, do all things without complaining and disputing in verse 14 to these words in verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God. Wow. In other words, if I'm a child of God, there ought to be something different about me and that something ought to show up in my grateful attitude toward all of life. As Jeremiah Johnson says, complaining is a selfish mindset that declares, I'm not getting what I deserve. Because this is done in the realm of God's sovereignty, what we are really saying is this, God, you're not being good to me. We've learned this very well from our first parent, Adam. God is our Father, and our well-being is His responsibility. And if we're complaining that we're not being taken care of, we are really insulting our Heavenly Father and saying, you're not doing a good job of taking care of your child. Hmm. You ever thought about it that way? That's what we're doing. You see, if you see my children and they're running around and unkempt and don't have clothes or shoes that fit, that's not a reflection on them. That's a reflection on me. Amen? 
And the same is true with us. If we're always complaining and griping about how bad everything is in life, it is an accusation of our Father because we have God as our Father who loves us and cares for us. Peter Stephen Lee writes this, Grumbling and whining, thanklessness, are not ultimately the heart's response to circumstances. They're our response to God. Israel grumbled at their enslavement. They grumbled when Moses came on the scene. They grumbled as they wandered safely in the wilderness. Their complaining wasn't rooted in their scenery, but in their heart. I love that. Their complaining wasn't rooted in their scenery, but in their heart. The same is true for us. A heart of gratitude and thankfulness is not dependent on our bank statement, our doctor's diagnosis, or the praise we receive for a job well done. Thanklessness and grumbling, regardless of our situation or even our suffering, reflects our heart. They are sin. Spiritual amnesia is a deadly disease that threatens your faith and your joy more than any cancer. It penetrates to the core and rots your heart from the inside out. What a great quote. The reality is that when we gripe and complain, it does damage to our own souls. Say, it does damage. Whenever I'm complaining and I'm fussing all the time, I do damage to my own heart. Do you hear me? It is impossible for faith and hope to abide in a heart that's always complaining and grumbling. Whenever I'm complaining, I'm training my mind to look for the negative. Whenever I'm always griping, I am focusing on the un what I feel is the unchanging nature of my own discomfort. And I'm losing sight of God's present goodness and the promise that things will be better in the future. Amen. And I'm training my heart to do that by the things that I say with my mouth. Lord, help me. Oh, pastor, we grumble and complain, but we don't mean it. The Bible says we do mean it because the Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. David said, I believe, therefore I've spoken. We speak what we believe. Amen. And if we believe that God is good and that he's going to be good to us, that will be in our mouth. But if we believe that we've been abandoned and that all hope is lost and things are bad and going to get worse, then that will be in our mouth. Complaining is a statement of what you really believe. And we often catch ourselves being honest, don't we? Yes. Lord, help us. It's quiet and holy in this church today. Hadn't even got good yet. I'm just saying. Hang in there. If left unchecked, my grumbling will fertilize the weeds of entitlement, of selfishness, of pride, and stubbornness that grows in my heart. It will damage my own soul. It will damage my faith and my hope in God. It will. As a good parent, God will not leave us to stew in our own juices of grumbling for very long. He warned the people of Israel in Numbers 14, How long will this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. If you believe, I believe that if you're a grumbling believer, if you're a complaining Christian, God will eventually take you to the woodshed over it. He will discipline you over that matter because you're saying something negative about your father. It's disrespectful to God. Amen. It is an affront to his love and care in my life. It's the opposite of the mind of Christ, which we're called to exhibit as Christ followers. By the way, that is the context of the verse in Philippians 2. Right before you get to don't grumble and complain, it says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. He didn't even complain in the face of the cross. Wow. Wow. And so you and I are called to bear up under life with an attitude that looks to God in thankfulness for all his blessing. If we're grumbling and complaining all the time, it is spiritual childishness at best, and it is stubborn unbelief at worst. If you've been able to persist in your grumbling for years without God's discipline, then the news may be even worse. It could be an indicator that you're not even saved. If he's not correcting you, it could be because you're not his child to correct God hears you but says, not my circus, not my monkey. Yeah. Because if you're living in sin and you're a Christian, you can be assured God will bring his discipline to bear in your life. It always makes me nervous when I hear church people say, well, I've done that for years and nothing bad's ever happened to me. If he's not whipping you, you're not his kid. Amen. So there's a reason he's not disciplining you. He don't handle the devil's children. Mm-hmm. Yes, but if I'm living in sin, God will deal with me because I'm his, amen? 
God will deal with us if we don't stop our mumbling and complaining. People who contradict the preacher and say, oh, there's not a big deal. They never experienced God's discipline. You scare me, I'm just saying. You make me nervous. You might want to check your spiritual birth certificate. Amen. Who benefits when I stop complaining? Number one, I do. That I might become blameless, harmless children of God in the present generation. Number two, let me tell you who else will benefit if we'll stop complaining. We stop complaining for the sake of the unsaved world. There are people around us who don't know the Lord. And our attitude has a lot to do with whether or not they will ever come to church and ever hear the gospel and meet Jesus. Verse 15 says, We live this way in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Now, what's right before that? Do all things without grumbling and complaining. In other words, if people are going to see the light of Jesus, two things have to be right about my life. My message, yes, I must hold forth the word of life, but also my manners. If they see that I live life without arguing and complaining, there's something about my life that attracts their attention. There's something that gives my message validity. There's something that makes Jesus attractive and appealing. Why? Because they sense that I'm actually using the product that I'm selling. Amen. Don't you hate it when a fat person tells you about the latest thing in diet technology? Amen. I'm not being mean, but I want to say, come back in 25 pounds and I might buy that. (laughs) Glory to God. (laughs) Yes. Well, the world feels that way about us as Christians sometimes. We come and we tell them, you know, when they see our lives and they hear our grumbling and complaining, and, and then we try to tell them about Jesus and how wonderful Jesus is, and they're sitting there wondering, well, why don't you meet him then? Yeah, why why hadn't he done? Jesus will change your life. And they look at us and say, well, he hadn't changed you a whole lot. Wow. We have to be using the product if we're going to sell it. We must be good witnesses of the message of Jesus. And our message matters, but our manner of life matters also. And Paul says very specifically, if you want to be a light in a crooked generation, then do all things without complaining or disputing. Wow, I didn't realize those two things were tied like that. They are. Read them. I'm not making this up. Philippians 2, 14 and 15, they go together. There's not even a period between those two. They just flow into each other. A mean old grouchy deacon was called upon one Sunday morning at the last minute to teach the elementary boys Sunday school class. And he walked in, sat down all serious and stern, and looked at the boys and grumbled and said, why do you suppose people say that I am a Christian? And one of the little boys spoke up and said, maybe because they don't know you as well as we do. (laughs) Our demeanor has a lot to say about our witness. Nonverbal communication, our expression, our attitude, our body language, all those things. People have read that in us before we ever get to the part about talking about Christ. Amen? And so we have to be careful what we're communicating, that we are embodying the message of Jesus. If you're advertising, you better use the product. If there's joy in Jesus, why am I always so sour? If the fruit of the Spirit is love, why am I mean? If he gives peace that passes understanding, why am I always a bundle of nerves about everything? If the Savior that we claim to follow was led as a lamb to the slaughter and yet opened not his mouth, why do we bark every time somebody Somebody bumps into us. Oh, it's quiet in the holiness church. Complaining is commonplace among people who don't know the Lord. And it ought to be. If you don't have a God and a Father, you've got something to complain about. If you're going through this life alone and you don't have anybody to watch out and take care of you, you've got grief. I'll be, I'll agree with you. You've got problems. You've got genuine problems and you've got something to be down in the mouth about. But I'm a Christian today and God is my maker and God is my father and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own and he leads me and guides me and he takes care of me and he hears me when I pray and he's good to me. 
And our attitude ought to be marked with thanksgiving and gratitude. The Bible warns us in the book of Jude that complainers are in the list with some very bad company. Have you ever noticed this? I don't think I ever noticed this till this week when I was studying uh, for this message. Jude 1 verse 15 says, Grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. And he's listing them with a group of people who won't make it to heaven. Wow, wait a minute, Pastor. Grumblers and complainers, that, that is among the group that demonstrate by their actions that they don't really know the Lord. Mm -mm. But Christians should be people of faith. We should be filled with an attitude of gratefulness and thanksgiving toward God in whom we've entrusted our lives. Oh, Christian, take yourself in hand. You have a Father who loves you and cares for you. Be careful what you say. People are listening. The world is listening, and they're beholding our attitude. So I will benefit myself if I will replace complaining with thanksgiving. The watching world around me will benefit if I replace thanksgiving. With, if I replace complaining with thanksgiving. And finally, listen, our leaders will benefit. We do it for the sake of our own soul, for the sake of the watching world, and lastly, for the sake of our leadership. Those who lead us in the Lord, it matters to them. Notice what Paul says in verse 16. He says, you should do all things without arguing and complaining. Why? Paul says, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain among you. What is Paul saying? Paul says, because I know that one of the marks of a child of God is an attitude of, of thanksgiving and gratitude, because I know that if you have the mind of Christ, you will stop griping and complaining all the time, Paul says, please don't disappoint me. I worked hard among you. I served as your pastor. I labored among you. I taught you God's Word. Let me see the evidence of that. Let me see the fruit of that in your life. Show me that you you were listening. Show me that God's Word has really done a work. Show me that the Spirit of God lives in you. Show me that the mind of Christ abides in you. Show me by living this kind of life. Don't let me be disappointed. Don't let me sit in the Roman jail cell and believe that maybe it was all for nothing. Paul writes this letter from prison, and he's thinking through, was it worth all that I went through to share the gospel? And the way he's going to say yes is when he sees the lives of men and women who've been transformed by the gospel. One of the things that makes it easy for a pastor or a church staff or a small group leader or a Sunday school teacher to continue to do and serve in the church is when the people that they serve show the evidence that their lives are really changing because of the investment. And that's what Paul says in the passage. Don't let me think that I've done this for nothing. Let me see the evidence in your life that God is really changing you. So one of the reasons we stop complaining is for the sake of our leadership. Now, when you read the book of Numbers, you realize pretty quickly that oftentimes the leadership is the source or the object of the, it's the object of the complaining. Oftentimes, what they're complaining about in the book of Numbers, they are complaining about the leadership. They didn't like Moses. They didn't like Aaron. They didn't like the pastor and his staff. And so they come up against them and they complain about them. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey those who have the rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable to you. And I want to tell you one of the things that robs Christian leaders of joy and fills them with grief is when the people they lead are prone to complain a lot. It's difficult. It's hard. It's hard to do work for God and to be faithful when everybody is happy. It's hard work then. It's really hard work whenever you feel like nobody really appreciates the fact that you're doing it. Many of us cringe when we read words like these on the screen, though. We say, what do you mean, obey? Be submissive to the to the people that lead our church? You can't be serious. I mean, last Sunday was Veterans Day, and we celebrated we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. Nobody's the boss over me, you might say. And our problem often is we bring our democracy with us to church. And we forget that the church is not a democracy. It is a kingdom. And Jesus is the king of that kingdom. 
and he has delegated some authority in his church. God's house has its own structure and order and government. Even in churches where the pastor is respected, sometimes his staff is not. I've seen the way that sometimes the laity treat the staff like the help. They often feel the liberty to sidestep their instructions or to ignore rules that they set within their own departments, and it leads to disruption in the programs that they lead. And oddly, those same people marvel whenever their children don't respect their boundaries or obey their rules. You taught them how. They're good disciples. Amen. Oh, that rule doesn't apply to me. Your child will feel the same way about his curfew, I guarantee you. Yeah, why? Because you taught them that you can sidestep that, that you don't have to listen to that. They are simply doing their best to respond to God's call. Your staff endure years of training, serving, and testing before being confirmed to each additional rank of ministry and entrusted with more spiritual authority. I know it sounds very self-serving for a pastor to preach about this. I hesitate to speak of it at all. But if you know me at all, you know that I made a promise to the Lord that I never back away from anything that I see in the Scripture. And in Numbers 11, it's very clear to me that the complaining that was pointed at their leadership was a biblical and spiritual issue. Therefore, I don't have any choice but to address it from God's Word. So hang in there, and we'll be at lunch together soon. Amen. Amen. I don't enjoy this any more than you do, but it is my assignment. I promised the Lord I'd be faithful and preach His Word. Lord, help me today. Listen. Let the elders who rule be counted worthy of double honor, the Bible says, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. But pastor, some of these staff guys are so young. Well, yes, they are. But in the same book of 1 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, don't let anyone despise your youth. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. So can I lovingly say to you, yes, your children's pastor is 22. Yes, your youth pastor is 21, and you may be old enough to be their mama or their grandpa or whatever. But when you walk into their department and they explain to you that their department operates in a certain way and that this is the rule, let me say to you, with all due respect, even though they're 21 and you're 41, if they've set that as a policy in their department, that is the policy in their department. And if you buck that and fly in the face of that, they're not out of line or disrespectful for enforcing the policy. You're not respecting those who have authority over that department in the church. Amen. And in that moment, your pastor is going to back a staff person. Why? Because the Bible says that I'm not to allow you to despise them because they're young. Amen. Mm, quiet and holiness, church. It's okay. It's okay. Listen, this is what the Word teaches us. We are to respect. Why? Because we're the ones who stood down here and laid our hands on these young men. We're the ones who brought them on staff and, and laid our hands on them and said, we trust you and we're charging you with this responsibility and we want you, we're inviting you to be among us as a man of God and we want you to lead our children and we want you to lead our young people and we want you to lead us in worship and we, we want you to lead our college kids and we're asking you to do these things. And if we have given them the responsibility, then we must also trust them with the authority. Hey, have you ever been given responsibility for something but not given authority to do it? Oh, isn't that just the most frustrating thing in the world? To feel responsible to do something that you don't actually have the power or authority to pull off? It's so frustrating. Well, the Bible is very clear. We don't do this because pastors are more special than anyone. We just do it because somebody has to be the quarterback and call the play. And this is who we've assigned the number, so we're going to run the play that was called. Is that okay? And if we run the play and don't get any yardage, we trust our leadership to realize that didn't work. We won't do that again. We'll make a better decision next time. But if we don't run the play that's been called, we don't have any shot of doing anything. Amen? Some of you watched some of your friends do that last night on the television screen, didn't you? Yeah. Some of us had a rough night last night, didn't we? Watching those ball games. Pastor, what is your point? My point is this. If we are constantly withstanding and complaining about the spiritual leaders the Lord has given us, or if we're resisting their authority and decisions, God will take personal issue with that. Is that in the Bible? I'm afraid it is. Exodus 16, hear the word of the Lord. The whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. 
Now, who did they complain against? Moses and Aaron. Keep reading. In the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in in Egypt. We sat by pots of meat, and we ate bread to the full. For you brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And also Moses said, verse 8, The Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. Against whom? Against him. Wait a minute. No, we're not complaining against the Lord. We're complaining against you, Moses and Aaron. We don't have a problem with God. We have a problem with the staff person. It's not what the text says. God read into it. God took their complaining against Moses and Aaron as a complaint against himself because he's the one who had assigned them their leadership. Hmm. Wow. And what are we, Moses says? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Read that with me. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Wow. Verse 2, they complained against Moses and Aaron, but verse 8 says God didn't see it that way. He read it as a personal complaint. You can't disrespect your pastors around the lunch table and complain that your children won't respond to their preaching. You can't ask God to speak to you in the worship service and then discount everything your pastor says because you have a grudge against the messenger. God won't speak. Well, God's speaking. You won't listen because you rejected the messenger. I just don't believe God can speak through him. Oh, get over yourself. God spoke through Balaam's donkey. Surely he can speak through your pastor. I am at least equally qualified to that prophet. Amen. (laughs) At least. (laughs) So God can most certainly speak to you. Open your heart and listen when you come to church. Allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. Some of us have dried up spiritually because we close our heart to God's minister. 2 Chronicles 20, 20 says, Believe in the Lord God and you'll be established. Believe his prophets and you'll prosper. Do you hear that? If we'll believe the man of God, it'll bless us. I'm not making this stuff up. Paul says one of the reasons the Philippians ought to stop complaining is out of respect for what he's taught them as a pastor. Listen to me. Everybody here could complain about something. We've all got things that we would prefer to be different. Some love the wood pallet crosses and the window panels, and some wish they would go. Incidentally, some complained when we took down the white panels because the sun was coming in. So we put up something more permanent, and they didn't like that either. Amen. I don't know. We'll figure it out together. That's what we'll do. Some people think we don't sing enough older music. Some people think our music is still way too dated. Some people don't like the changing light scenes. Uh, Some people wish the room were darker than it is. Uh, Some people don't like the changing lights at all. Some people, listen, uh, attended conferences as a young person and fell in love with that kind of thing. Some people think it ought to be bright because God is light and in Him is no darkness. And so they spiritualize the matter. Other young people were saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and called to preach at youth camp and Winterfest services where the room was dark and it felt more intimate and they felt like they could pray and not be self-conscious because it didn't feel like everybody was staring at them because the lights were up. Some people wish the music was louder. Other people think it's too loud already. Some people wish there was no time limit on the service and others are upset if they don't get out by noon every week. If you're looking for a church where you get out at noon every week, I would not recommend a Pentecostal one. Amen. Some folks want to plug in and serve in their newfound church home. Other people don't want to share their place of service, even though they've held that spot for decades. I'm not saying to anybody, I'm not telling anybody to go home from your place of service. I'm just asking, will you scoot over and share your spot with someone else? Will you train someone else to do what you've done for years? Because if you've done it for 30 years, I can promise you something. You won't do it for another 30. I mean, just the law of age is going to catch up with you. You won't be able to do it forever. And instead of holding on to it till you die, what would really help me would be if you would train somebody to do what you do so that there's no gap whenever you pass off the scene, but that you'd actually, you know, do what the Bible said and disciple somebody to do what you do. Wow, that's a novel thought, isn't it? Yeah. Some people, let people say, oh, well, they're not willing to learn. Well, maybe you're picking up your own scent. Have you tried? 
Maybe they know a few things themselves when they come in. Be willing to share and serve alongside other people. Listen, let me take a turn for a moment about this. Listen, some people wish we had Sunday night services instead of growth groups. Other people wish we'd cancel all the Sunday night services and go to growth groups. And my growth group leaders say, I'm barely getting the house clean every two weeks. If you go to every week, there's no way I'm going to be able to continue. Amen. Let me tell you what I wish as a pastor. Since everyone else gets to complain, I'll take a moment and join in. I'll join you in your sin for about two minutes. Are you ready? Okay. See, this is why Moses missed the promised land. They tempted him and he sinned too. That's right. That's what happened. That's what happened. And it happened in the book of Numbers. Yes. Be careful, leaders. You can lose your soul if you're not careful. All right. Pastor, what do you wish? I wish we would just get our focus back on the Great Commission that Jesus left us. I wish we would save our passion for things that will matter one ounce five minutes after the trumpet sounds. I wish we would get so burdened about reaching the next generation and creating a church where our grandchildren's spiritual needs are met that we would be willing to lay down our own preferences in order to achieve that. I wish we could be more focused on who we're trying to reach than constantly tiptoeing around those we're trying to keep for fear that they may leave. I've made up my mind that I'm saved. I started out to make it, and I'm going to make it home to heaven. And I'm not going to fall out with God or with my local church over a bunch of non-essential style choices and personal preferences. I'm going to make it to heaven if we sing out of the red back, or I'm going to make it if we sing Bethel every Sunday, or if we sing both of them. I'm still going to heaven. Amen. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout if the lights are bright. I'm going to shout if the lights are low. I'm going to shout because Jesus saved me, and I'm not going to hell anymore. And I'm grateful for that reality. Amen? I'm just thankful for that. Thank God I'm saved. Amen. I wish that we would be more focused on, on those things. I wish, listen, I've made up my mind. I'm going to focus in on those things. The Israelites got so focused on the minutia that they, of what they didn't like right in front of them, they completely lost sight of the greater realities. What are the greater realities? And I'm closing with this. There were three great realities they lost their grip on. They lost sight of, number one, they forgot where they'd come from. They were slaves in the land of Egypt, and God had set them free. They no longer had anybody breathing down their neck. There were no whips falling across their shoulders anymore. They weren't making bricks anymore. They were free. They belonged to God. He was their only master now. He had parted the Red Sea and brought them through on dry ground. But they'd forgotten all about how God had saved them and God had rescued them and God delivered them. They were just focused on the pot of manna in front of them and they didn't like it. And they were focused on that and they forgot where God had brought them from. Say where he brought them from. Number two, they forgot where they were headed to. They forgot where they were going. They were going to a land flowing with milk and honey. They were going to live in houses they didn't build. They were going to eat vineyards they didn't plant. They were going to a place where they were going to be blessed and highly favored and loaded down with the benefits of a good God. God was taking them to the promised land, but they lost sight of where they were headed because they're just focused on their little bowl of manna and they don't like the way it's seasoned. And number three, they'd, for, they'd lost sight of the past and the future, and they lost sight of the present. They forgot that while they were complaining in the wilderness about the manna and Moses, that they were standing there enjoying the protection and the provision of God. While they're complaining, there's a wall of angels around them. While they're complaining, there's a pillar of fire in front of them by night and a pillar of cloud in front of them by day. And while every Every time the enemy attacks, the enemy gets pushed back and defeated because nobody can stand before them because their God is with them and he's taken up their cause in the fight. And they constantly live under the protection and the provision of a good God. And they lost sight of all of that because they were looking down at their little bowl of manna that they didn't like. Oh, have mercy. 
And I want to tell you the thing I've noticed about my own life is when I'm complaining, it's because I've got my nose buried in two or three current circumstances that I don't like. And what I need more than anything is somebody to come alongside and lift up my head and say, remember the pit that God pulled you out of. Remember the debt of sin that he canceled for you. Remember that you're not going to hell anymore. Remember the heaven that is in front of you, streets of gold and walls of jasper where there's no pain or sorrow or crying anymore because the former things have passed away. And look around you and remember where you are and how good and faithful God has been to you. Look around you today. Lord, help us today. Don't forget where you've come from. Don't forget where you're headed to. And don't forget how good God's being to you right now, leading, feeding, providing, guiding, protecting in the wilderness. Even now, the thing that I love about our church, although there may be some things that you wish were different, I get that. We all have those moments and things. But let me lift your head for a moment as your pastor. God is blessing our church. God is blessing our church. Our number of young families is growing week by week. We're making new strides and breaking through the race barrier in our community. We're planning outreach events that will impact the neighborhood around us. God is blessing our Hispanic outreach in Sims. Our college department, our choir, our youth, our children's department, every one of those departments are growing week by week. We had 40 men show up at a men's event yesterday afternoon to fellowship together together yesterday morning God is blessing us so whether you're young or you're old whether you wish things were more one way or more the other way it all comes down to the choice of our attitude in the end do not complain as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer first Corinthians 10 10 says for Philippians 2 14 I close where we began do all things without complaining and disputing now, what if you're a leader today and people complain? Maybe you're a growth group leader or a Sunday school leader or a pastor or, or you volunteer in a department and, and people get crossways with you. Do what Moses did. He fell before the Lord and said, Lord, you see where I am. I need you to vindicate me and validate my leadership. And then number two, he got up and he just kept leading. So just be faithful. God will honor your service to him. Okay, pastor, but what do we do if we really don't like the way things are right now? Listen. Take it to God in prayer. Say that with me. Take it to God in prayer. Pray about it. The difference between complaining and prayer is often who you're talking to. I'm not allowed to gripe and complain to other people because it diminishes their faith and it, it, it's contagious and it has a negative effect on them. What I am allowed to do is go in and shut the door and tell God what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. Amen. In fact, whenever you read a lament in the Bible, the opening part is called the complaint. We lay our complaint out before the Lord. God doesn't mind if you do that. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Job complained to God, and it was considered an act of faith because he trusted the Lord. The Israelites complained to one another because they didn't want to talk to God because they were afraid they knew what God would say about it. And that was considered an act of sin because it was rooted in their distrust and unfaithfulness. The Psalms are full of believers who complain to God in prayer. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't push them away for that. He invites them to come and lay their heart open before him. He honors the fact that they came to him in faith and choose to keep trusting and obeying even though things are hard and difficult. Want a better pastor or staff? Pray for them. Pray for them. Amen. Maybe we're just as good as your prayers. Yeah, pray for us. Lift us up to the Lord. We're human. We make mistakes. We err. We don't always get it right the first time or even the second. But if you'll pray for us and walk in patience with us, together God will lead our church forward. And we can do great things for the kingdom of God. Number two, the Bible says learn to be content. Say content. Paul says to the Philippians, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. <laughs> we learn how to be content. It isn't natural. We have to learn how. Can I tell you, I've noticed something since I got 40. I'm 42. I'll be 43 in January. And all the older saints, I'm sure you will tell me that I'm right about this. It seems to me like past 40, God gives you more and more opportunity to learn how to be content. <laughs> Amen. Some days I feel like Tony Lewis. He said, somebody said, cheer up. 
things could be worse. And sure enough, I cheered up and they got worse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but my right knee hurts. Give it a year. Both knees will hurt. <laughs> Amen. Uh, yeah. You got a year to get content with the left one. <laughs> Amen. Learn. I have learned to be content, Paul says, in whatever state I'm in. Lord, help us. We laugh to keep from crying, don't we? We have to learn to be content. Some things remain the same, even though I wish they would change. Some things that I wish would change don't, and it makes me frustrated. God keeps allowing me more unpleasant stuff so I can learn the lesson of contentment. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ. If he did not complain in the face of the cross, surely I can learn the lesson to be content in my circumstances. God is determined to wean us off the world and to wean us off of having to have our own way all the time in order to be happy. And as long as we're still screaming and grasping, it means we're not weaned yet. And God's going to keep weaning us until we learn the lesson of contentment, until we grow up in Him. Amen. Number three, count your blessings. Stand with me on this. Chad, come help me. Count your blessings. Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 5. The reason we complain is we often forget how good God has been to us. The Bible says, forget not all his benefits. We often forget. Even in the worst circumstances, we can find something to be thankful for. Matthew Henry, that great commentator from the Old Testament, I shared this story with my senior adults Wednesday when I taught that class. Matthew Henry was robbed one night, and his wallet was taken from him. And that night, when he sat down to have his devotion, the passage of Scripture that he was reading for that night, working his way through the Bible, was this verse, In all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And he thought, well, I've got a tall order tonight, don't I? They robbed me and took my wallet, and now my devotion says I'm supposed to give thanks in this circumstance. How am I supposed to do that, he wondered. But he sat down with his pen, and he opened his journal, and he wrote the following words. Number one, I am thankful that I had never been robbed before. Hmm. Number two, I am thankful that although he took my wallet, he did not take my life. Number three, although he took all I had, it was not much. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a complaint or a thanksgiving, right? <laughs> Number four is my favorite. I am glad that it was I who was robbed and not I who did the robbing. No matter what bad thing happens to me this week, I can be thankful that I'm not who I used to be. And that God saved a sinner by his absolute grace and mercy and picked me up and dusted me off and took my name off the roll of hell and put my name on the roll to heaven. And nothing that happens to me this week is able to undo or erase that fact. Neither life nor death nor angels nor demons nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor anything in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. Oh, child of God, we can be thankful. We know where we came from. We know where we're headed toward. And we know the faithfulness and goodness of God right here in the present. Oh, how we ought to replace our complaining with gratitude. For the sake of your own soul, for the sake of a watching world, for the sake of your leaders and Sunday school teachers and pastor's council members and all those in the church who work so hard to take us forward. Are you a complaining Christian today? It's out of character with your new nature in Jesus. And if you don't deal with it, eventually he will. I'm urging you fix it today number two are you a grumbling unbeliever <laughs> it could be that the reason we grumble and complain all the time is we really have not taken the medicine that we prescribe for others have you met Jesus has the Holy Spirit really given you a new heart has God really come to live on the inside of you 
If so, where's the evidence of the love and the joy and the peace and the kindness and the favor and the gentleness and the meekness and the self-control? If he's in there, it ought to be showing up somewhere. Is he there? Or are you, like Hebrews writer says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Has he saved you? Is that overflowing in your life? Joy, peace, grace, thanksgiving. These are the marks of the children of God. That we bring the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name when we gather. Every head bowed for just a moment. We're going to sing a closing song and then we'll go today. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you've never trusted Jesus as Savior, can I urge you today, God loved you so much, he sent his son to die on the cross for you. And there is a way that your sins can be forgiven. And your name can be written in heaven and you can know that you're saved. And you can know that you're going to make it home one day by trusting Jesus and what he did by dying and rising for you. Have you trusted in him? If you've never done that, I would urge you to come find a place to kneel and pray. One of us would love to introduce you to Christ this very morning. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian, but you're a complaining Christian. You're a grumbling believer. <laughs> Can I give you a challenge today? Repent of that. Repent of that. Take your needs to God in prayer. Learn how to be content. Amen. And learn how to be thankful. Give thanks to God. Most of it is about what we focus on. Allow God today to lift your gaze from the little bowl of manna that makes you so unhappy and to show you the multiplicity of things around you you have to be grateful for. A past that's forgiven, a present that's free, and a future in heaven that is secured for you by the blood of Jesus. Let Jesus give you a thankful heart today. Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your people. I thank you for this church. Shay and I love this group of people that we get to do life with. Lord, I'm so thankful for how they care for us and how they care for their staff. I'm so grateful for the hard work that they put in every week to make the ministries of this church go forward. Lord, I pray your blessing on them today. Lord, I, there are some of us in the room today who really are struggling right now. And we can, we can joke and make light of it, but there's some in the room today who honestly are facing great difficulty and have been through hard seasons of pain and their tears are real and their pain is too father I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would lay your hand on them and Lord I pray that you would help them and strengthen them to find joy in the middle of their trial to find the peace of God right in the midst of circumstances that they wish were so very different than they are and Lord I pray today that you would reach down and support and help them and they would be able to lay hold of the grace of God that is able to sustain them through their current difficulty. Lord, I pray that they wouldn't lose their peace, they wouldn't lose their joy, they wouldn't lose their faith and the confidence and hope in God in the middle of all this. But Lord, they would hold on to you and you would strengthen them. And Lord, I pray for anyone today who doesn't know Christ that today would be the day they trust him savingly. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're going to sing. The altar's open, and we're going to go. Let's lift our heart to the Lord. If you need to pray, I invite you to come. Chad, lead us in worshiping the Lord. One more time. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful
Do you love the Lord? Would you give him a hand of praise this morning? Lord, you've been so good to us. Lord, you've been so good to us. So good to us, Lord. So good to us. Receive this benediction from the Lord. Remember the showers at 3 for Katie and Jacob. And then 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock, depending on your group. Your group meets tonight. Go and join them. We'll see you back here on Wednesday. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God